It has always seemed to me that when we begin to study the work of a human being, we become interested in the human being behind the work. Perhaps this should not be true. Perhaps we should accept things uh, simply on their face value. But we are all tied and bound to the human state. And we like to orient our heroes in that state. We are actually perhaps helped more by the humanity in man than we are in the supposed divinity in man. The humanity brings us close together. And in the case of General Pike, it reveals to us the happy combination of a scholar and a truly delightful person. A person who had many friends simply because he was friendly and who had an almost unending sense of humor, even though much of his life was burdened with most serious responsibilities. We have tried to have something to say about the general as a person, therefore, each evening, and we're going to select a few points this evening from early articles about him, which perhaps are not generally known and which may not be included in the popular available biographies. After he reached uh, the area of Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, which he came to sometime after 1832, and here became a small village school teacher uh, teaching in a log cabin schoolhouse, we find that a natural tendency which showed from his early boyhood continued to unfold, and that was his poetic uh, abilities, which were largely recognized and which undoubtedly have contributed to the beauty of the work that he did. Uh, we find, for instance, that while he was teaching school, this biographer notes, again his pen was busy writing verses for the Little Rock Advocate, as well as political articles, under the pen name Casca, which attracted so much notice that Horace Greeley reprinted them in the New York Tribune. And so shortly after, there was a statewide search in Arkansas to discover who this Casca was. And it finally centered upon this rather amiable, somewhat timid, round-shouldered schoolteacher. And uh, from that time on, his literary fame increased. And he has left quite a rich legacy of good poetry, which will be of interest to one group of persons. Also, Albert Pike was involved in the Mexican War. Uh, prior to the time of the Civil War, and we find the following notes. In the war with Mexico, uh, Pike won fame for his valor in the, at the field of Buena Vista, and enshrined the story of this occasion in one of his poems. After the war, he took up the cause of the Indians, whose life and happiness fascinated him, and who he felt were being robbed of their rights. He carried their cause to the Supreme Court, to whose bar he was admitted in 1849 together with Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin. His speech in the, in the case of the Senator War to the Choctaws is famous, and Webster passed high eulogy upon it. Judged by any test, Pike was a great orator, uniting learning with practical acumen, grace with power, and that in imperious magnetism, which only a genius can command. Albert Pike was made a Master Mason in Western Star Lodge No. 1, Little Rock, Arkansas, July 1850. And from that time on, we see the forces at work which caused him gradually to turn practically all of his learning in the direction of Freemasonry. He, has, he had brought to it <coughs> brilliant legal background, a good literary background, and outstanding achievements in poetry and essay, 
and he also brought to it a tremendous personal capacity for research and study. As a result of his initiation into the order and his gradual increasing interest in it from a philosophical standpoint, we find his following summary of the situation which caused him to devote his entire life practically from that time on with the brief interlude of the Civil War to the advancement of the Masonic research program. He says of Masonry, it began to shape itself to my individual vision into something imposing and majestic, solemnly mysterious and grand. It seemed to me like the pyramids in their grandeur and loneliness, in whose yet undiscovered chambers may be hidden for the enlightenment of coming generations the sacred books of the Egyptians, so long lost to the world, like the Sphinx half buried in the sands. In its symbolism, which and its spirit of brotherhood are its essence. Freemasonry is more ancient than any of the world's living religions. So I came at last to see that its symbolism is its soul. Uh, from this foundation, we can perhaps begin to estimate why he devoted the greater part of his effective, mature life to the effort to restore this symbolism and why, in order to do so, he had to follow an ancient course, and that is to seek in the most remote corners of the world and in the most difficult branches of learning for the keys to these symbols. And also, as he expresses it, he had to penetrate layer after layer of interpretation, the encrustations of ages, uh, the pollutions of both time and era in an effort to restore as far as possible the primitive meanings of these ancient figures. And so this evening we are going to devote most of our time to exploring along with him and in his way uh, the essential symbols with which he became concerned. Pike would have been the first to point out that these symbols are not the private property of masonry. These symbols derive themselves from practically every tradition of the world. Yet that there must be beneath all symbolism a substance, a meaning real and valid, would seem to be of interest and importance to us all. For in the search into the field of comparative religion, in which symbolism plays a most vital part, we come constantly upon images and figures difficult to comprehend, confusing, and at the same time utterly fascinating. We also realize that in this pursuit of symbolic lore to its fountainhead, we must begin with some conviction, some concept, and General Pike begins with one very basic fact, namely that the symbol which has endured from time immemorial, going back to the earliest thinking, to the most basic ideals of the human race, comes the nearest to anything that we have to a universal language. The moment we lock our thoughts in words, we, meet, we restrict our meanings to those of kindred tongue. The moment we attempt uh, to uh, interpret in the terms of familiar things. We also impose a dogmatism upon meaning. And gradually most symbols have been dogmatized. They have been given a meaning or perhaps a group of meanings. And these are assumed to exhaust uh, the research in the subject. The moment we place a dogma upon any natural growing concept, we blight it with an early frost. We create a pattern of acceptances, a mere a lip acceptance of terms and words and patterns, uh, presumably exhausted by those who have gone before us. Pike warned of this very definitely. He stated 
that there may be a thousand interpretations already known for a certain symbol. But if we are content to accept any or all of them, we shall some way deprive ourselves of the greatest adventure of all, and that is the personal exploration of the idea, the search within ourselves for meaning, and that the language of symbolism invites us all to search for meaning. He next assumes, which I think most of us here would concur with his belief, that not only was symbolism a language, but it was a language about something. It was a language relating to a particular kind of material, a particular level of fact. And uh, the reason that this fact has remained expressed only in symbolism for thousands of years is due to one circumstance in itself also undeniable. That is that men have never found a better way of, per of perpetuating these facts than through symbols. Had at any time the full and true meaning of a symbol been so completely, absolutely, and entirely crystallized that it could be presented in an irrefutable uh, literary or philosophical statement, the symbol itself would have vanished. It would have no longer been significant. Men do not search for that which is found, but for that which is not found. The individual, therefore, is entitled to assume that the language of symbolism relates to something about which there is no common knowledge, about which there is no other adequate instrument for the perpetuation of certain ideas. What type of material would be, therefore, most like likely to be locked in an enigma, to be concealed behind some form, shadow, or semblance not identical with its own structure or nature? The answer would have to be that it is some kind of knowledge pertaining to things not to be literally seen, not to be factually examined, not available in their full and pure substance, but to be known only through the lengthened shadows of themselves, cast upon matter, cast upon mind, and gradually molded into a fantastic imagery. Such knowledge as this would therefore not be the knowledge that has descended to us in philosophy. It would not be the knowledge available to us in the rituals and formulas of accepted theology. It would not be the type of knowledge that could be expounded in mere mathematical formula or revealed to us completely under a scientific hypothesis. It has to be something in its own nature so elusive that it cannot be captured and can therefore only be known through this shadow cast by itself. The answer again in Pike's thinking is obvious. That which is not available to us in knowledge is simple. It is knowledge itself. In other words, we know about many things and the substance of very little. We have learned opinions on innumerable problems, conditions, circumstances, but this essential knowing which might cause the individual with the full realization of the meaning of his words to say, this I know. This level of knowing is exceedingly scarce. And where it exists, it relates mostly to secondary things. We know that the sun appears to rise. We know the length of days and of hours. Uh, we know certain laws of architecture. We know uh, certain ways of analyzing the chemical constitutions of things. By mathematical formula, we can split an atom. But by mathematical formula, we do not know what an atom is. The true and essential knowledge, therefore, is not in its pure substance ever available to man in a natural state. 
If it comes to him, how does he receive it? He must receive it by revelation, by vision, by intuition, by insight. He must in some way gain it through an experience which he cannot share with others. He may attempt to share, but the moment a knowing passes from him to another, that which comes to him as knowing is accepted by that other as an acceptance, as an opinion, as an interpretation, or as a belief. Therefore, that which we communicate can be believed by others, but that which we communicate can only be known to ourselves. There is this mysterious interval between self and others, and while our own insight may convince us of the inevitable truth of a thing, we also come upon another dilemma. The insight of others give to them different interpretations of the same thing. Therefore, to say I know is not only an indication of penetration, but it is also a completely individual project. The individual can know for himself. He may know that which is necessary to himself, but this knowing he cannot say will be identical with the knowing of any other person. He may like to affirm the philosophical concept that if persons come to the same level of insight, they will attain to the same substance of knowing. But as each person is different, it has become exceedingly difficult to assume or to discover even the levels of insight upon which a number of persons may function. The only levels we have available to us are levels of interpretation, levels of believing, and levels of acceptances. Thus, according to General Pike, it would seem obvious that a symbolism which is extended around the world and it descended throughout time to be valid, uh, to be worthy of perpetuation, to hold as it has the admiration of the most learned and the most informed and enlightened of mortals, that this symbolism must deal with these things about which man cannot come to external factual knowledge. These symbols must therefore relate not to effects but to causes, not to consequences as we see them but substances that, as they exist in the nature of being. He is strengthened in this con concept by another point, namely that the great wealth of symbolism has grown up around sacred matters. The greater body of symbolism has to do with the attributes of deity, with the substance of human consciousness, with the nature of the human soul, with the substance and material of the human mind, and also in large measure with the great circle or cycle of man's psychic experience leading not only through the years of this life, but postulating the future state of the soul in time to come and beyond the grave. These things then relate to certainties which men desire to possess, but which they do not at the present time adequately possess. Thus it is no common knowledge which can be easily rescued and then turned into sermons or into texts but an uncommon kind of knowledge. That knowledge which has to do with ultimates, with infinites, and with the great universal values which men have sought from the beginning and about which even now they have come to no common conclusion. If this then be the burden of symbolism, General Pike can justify his own statement that it is to be found in its purest and most wonderful form in the great mystery institutions of the ancient world. These institutions were dedicated to the greatest spiritual values that we know. And the greater this spiritual dedication, 
the more luxurious was the symbolism employed, the more fantastic the imagery, the more complicated the keys to its unlocking. And uh, wherever we went or wherever we go in the search of the ruins of ancient wisdom, we behold the sanctuary ornamented with devices difficult to interpret, of unknown origin, and dealing with the most abstract convictions of man. Now symbolism then breaks down into a series of patterns, and our beginnings of symbolism undoubtedly go back uh, to the dawn of our experience. And for a moment let us pause and consider some of the most aboriginal pictoglyphs that we have been able to discover in the search for our knowledge of primordial man. On rocks, upon the face of great boulders and ancient cliffs, rising in desert and wilderness, we find strange devices, mostly simple, geometrical, basic forms. These devices are sometimes referred to as picture writing. There are many examples of picture writing right here in the state of California. We find many rocks covered with strange forms and figures. Why were they put there? Who put them there? How shall we decipher them? They were put there by crude instruments, perhaps the chiseling of a stone with a harder stone, perhaps in some cases with the use of early tempered copper, or as the Egyptians, various files and uh, chisels and other instruments of soft metal, their teeth set in in jade or in uh, emerald in order to give them a cutting edge. These ancient symbols were put for one reason primarily. They were to perpetuate something. It was that the man who put them there, or the tribe who fashioned this strange picture writing, wished to leave a record of something. Perhaps his basic impulse was completely egocentric although undoubtedly he had no awareness of it, never having been under psychoanalysis. <laughs> but in any event, perhaps what he was searching for was one of the most basic needs that man experiences. He was searching rather pathetically, childishly, desperately for immortality. He was searching for that mysterious quality of not being forgotten. He wanted to live. He wanted to live in one of two ways that he knew that man could live. He believed probably, from example, in sorry incident around him, that this physical part of his own nature uh, was fragile and would not long endure. But there was another part of it, his dream, his hope the great and wonderful deeds that he had done, his claim to be remembered, his claim to make a contribution to those who came after him, his claim that those who followed would remember the hunt and the forest and the day when he had slain the great mammoth. These things he wanted to have lived because they were his hero self. And today, even in this 20th century, there are well-educated, scientifically trained human beings who have had exposure to three or four thousand years of culture who will say today that no man has any immortality except to be remembered through his works. This is not an uncommon attitude among those who feel that they are emancipated from all the superstitions of the past. But this primitive man wanted to be remembered. He therefore used devices. And where did he find his symbols? He found his symbols in the beginning of language, nature. He found his first speech in the sounds of nature. He found his first designs and artistry. 
in the simple crude representation of things around him things to which he gave a new kind of meaning and in most cases this meaning was a motion from a concrete to an abstract point of view for example perhaps he regarded the great cave bear as a very strong and brave animal now this brought with it a gradual development of an idea an association mechanism and in time the glyph of the cave bear was no longer a representation of this animal merely to perpetuate the animal it became the symbol of the attributes of the primitive mind associated with the animal therefore this bear became the emblem of strength or of courage or of endurance or whatever attribute the human being found most uh, acceptable in the study of the animal thus by degrees men developed totems in which they took the names of these creatures as symbols of their powers we find this still among American Indian tribes and among many other primitive people and in all through the Central American complex of civilizations we find uh, that the totem or the symbol of the person is placed above his head in the glyphs and this is the key to his name and to the virtues which he represents or to the dedication uh, of his own life to the exemplification of certain qualities thus we see the bear becoming the symbol of bravery we see the Sun losing its actual astronomical meaning to become one of several things first light second time the Sun became a symbol of time because it gradually came to be called the figure of day or days and primitive man began his counting of days by the number of risings and settings of the Sun for a longer period he chose the moon and therefore he began to have uh, a kind of simple calendar things that were three days back were three suns back things that were three months back were three moons back and beyond a comparatively small number of suns and moons his chronology became rather corrupt it uh, he had no uh, in early times he had no concept of longer periods this came later but the Sun then became the symbol of light it became the symbol of days it became an emblem representing insight it became a sign of blessedness or of good it gradually unfolded into a sign of wisdom because it was opposed to the darkness of night which was ignorance it became associated with integration and orientation as opposed to the chaos of night and by degrees then each of these natural objects gained a more or less abstract meaning a meaning which carried it into a world of invisible values a brave animal can be seen or a brave man but bravery as a fact is not visible except by some action by which it is personified or some condition which exemplifies it so the moment man began to think of qualities as apart from physical objects themselves he had to go into symbolism he also found various problems arising in the development of his word structures where he discovered early in life that the most difficult concept to express in some visible form capable of being uh, perpetuated is motion it is very difficult to indicate motion on an immovable surface he could not make a glyph that would fly off the surface and therefore be true to motion he had to create the concept of motion without the object itself moving one of his earliest experiences in this as we see by studying the pictoglyphs is the use of a series of footprints 
These footprints indicate a journey. They may also indicate that their beginning and termination, uh, the locations involved locations at that time being so crude and rude we cannot dis rediscover them even from the glyphs. But this long string of footprints was not entirely a happy thing. He could try to create the concept of motion through re representing his animals and other creatures as in the ancient caves of France in motion. But a bison in motion is not really a very happy substitute for a necessary abstract verb. It is not, it is not very solutional. Yet he had to have motion. You know, Maya solved it by putting a wing on a noun and making a verb out of it. The moment he added a wing, it symbolized motion. Very ingenious and requiring a great deal of thought uh, to develop. But he did find the need constantly for creating forms for the expression of values not visible as objects. So out of this early struggle came the rise of pictoglyphic and hieroglyphic forms. The hieroglyph was an organized pictoglyph and the, probably the greatest development in this uh, situation is found in the languages of Egypt and of China. In both cases we have an inconceivable array of such picture forms. We may also of course mention the Maya glyphs which number over 10,000 but unfortunately they are not as easy to use as some of the others because we simply have not yet been able to decode them. But in the Chinese and in the Egyptian we are in somewhat better uh, condition. The Egyptian language, although it comes to us in its earliest form in a highly developed state, still shows that it was the inevitable evolution of the rough and crude uh, cuttings upon the walls of cliffs and rocks. It is a gradual refinement. But the Egyptians began to discover means of making their symbols more valuable, making them more useful. They gradually came to identify out of all of their animal pictures and their various symbolic devices, for each of which they had a name, they gradually developed a sound equivalent. Uh, this was frequently derived simply from the beginning of the name of the object. And an object like, for instance, arm, representing the human arm, uh, suggested to them the possibility of the R sound as well as the complete name. This R sound could be combined with other sounds. Among the Aztecs it was done more simply. They took two creatures, uh, the, for instance, they wanted to make a word out of two names. So they would take the name for tiger and the name for snake. Uh, they wanted to use the first half of the name for tiger and combine it with the last half of the name of snake. So they made a glyph, the front end of tiger and the back end of snake. And then they proceeded to read it. It gave them therefore the possibility of bestowing this glyph as a name upon something. And this is how we read the place names of the old Mexican cities and towns. They placed this glyph in association with a little device called a mound. And when the mound and the place name were put together, it meant a city. If they drove a spear or an atlatl through the mound, it means they had conquered the city. And one by one, these simple devices developed. So the Egyptian language passed into a new form in which it consisted of both ideas and of sound. This became rather complicated, but it uh, also gave rise to the possibility of the Egyptian uh, attaining a certain written form in which he was able to express sequences of abstract ideas and use for these sequences hieroglyphs which suggested so sound arrangements and by their grouping compounding names of objects. 
when they wished a word or a section of glyph to represent primarily a sound or an order of sounds, as in the case of a proper name, they placed a cartouche around it. That is, they drew a line around the entire thing, saying this is one word instead of a series of glyphs. So in most of their manuscripts, we find picture writing, hieroglyphical development and structure, and then every so often, an encircled group of characters signifying that these shall be read together to form a name or the, to form a proper word of some nature. This went on until gradually the pictoglyphic form began to fade away, and the symbols were not essentially changed, but passed through a condition of human carelessness. This human carelessness caused, finally, these glyphs to be drawn so poorly uh, that as glyphs they were comparatively undecipherable. The individual taking these pictures simply sh uh, streamlined them. He uh, created a kind of shorthand out of them, using perhaps only the principal stroke of a particular glyph, the one stroke which distinguished it from all other glyphs. And he found that by degrees he could speed up the process of writing and the hieroglyphical form about the beginning of the Christian era began to drift into the hieratic form, which consists of the loss of the symbol in a conventionalized letter. As this proceeded more rapidly, the advantage of the picture glyph as a means of identifying objects gradually ceased, and the entire process moved into an alphabetic form with words spelled out to form uh, new dimensions for the concepts to be perpetuated. This also followed definitely in connection with the Chinese method of writing. Uh, we find that uh, the original glyphs were very often very close uh, to the object represented. Their little uh, pit pitched roof character, which is essentially a roof originally meant a covering consisting of two lines drawn this way, just like the sides of a roof. Well, that was a covering originally. It finally became very much more involved. The oldest Chinese glyph for a horse, for example, has four small dashes under it to represent the horse's feet. Uh, it was pretty literal. And among uh, other languages, it is true that the Chinese perhaps has changed less than most others. Now, uh, uh, the Chinese have a symbol for tree, a very simple glyph. Now they were also concerned with uh, what we might term the plural forms and how were they going to handle that. If they were somewhere and they found uh, another tree and they wanted to have uh, two trees clearly indicated, uh, they followed the line of greatest expediency. They made two trees side by side and that was what exactly what it meant two trees. But this didn't end the problem because it could get worse. Another man decided that he wanted to say that he had just been in the forest. Now this presented a more or less complicated situation. You couldn't keep on drawing trees all over the page. So the happy idea of the simple plural came into existence. Above two trees must be many trees. So they put a third figure of a tree and the result was forest. Above two means forest, a very simple device. And in this way, they had no difficulty in ultimately uh, indicating their meaning. They had many different symbols. When they made the sign of a roof, uh, they then placed a symbol of fire beneath the roof, and a fire under a roof is a home, a place where you live. Uh, another simple problem is that they anciently used for conveyance a kind of a cart. And if you look down on this cart from above, you saw the axle running through the two wheels. You saw the flat, straight edges of the two wheels, and in between, a large rectangular mass representing the body of the cart. This particular symbol was reduced to simply mean center, middle. 
because it represented uh, the uh, middle part, a central axis moving through something. And this became associated with the original name of China, which was the Middle Kingdom. Thus they went on, by degrees, building up a most elaborate group of writings, multiplying their strokes, increasing their skill and knowledge, until finally they produced a language so flexible that almost any idea which man can express can be rather adequately presented. These things all rose from natural symbolic instinct. Uh, the effort to use simple things to express or explain difficult things. The uh, effort to convey a total picture of a meaning and at the same time lock it only in a very few strokes or letters. To do this uh, also, of course, created a kind of association the individual who knew approximately the meaning to be intended got the complete impact of it, perhaps even more completely than we do with words today. They got the feeling of what was intended. Uh, they got a, a simple and direct relationship. They were not so far removed into polysyllabic forms as we are and they, they did not have to rush to the dictionary the way we do because they had a very quick uh, grasp of the symbolic idea. Now these are primitive things but they point the way along which General Pike was exploring and it comes then to the uh, next important conclusion which he reached namely that nearly all symbols arise from nature. A symbol is a form and it must be derived from a form. We cannot have a symbol, a picture of anything, unless that picture is derived from something within our world of experience. Therefore, the picture must be the result of man's own eyes. He may add to the eyes certain reasoning powers, but he must first use the eyes. He cannot conceive of a form which does not exist, nor can he make a picture involving a pattern which has no similitude in life or nature. Thus he was forced to derive his language from his world and from the world of circumstances. Pike, however, points out what several other authors have also noted, namely that the selection of these forms and the investigation in the effort to discover appropriate forms for ideas forced primitive man to a most dramatic conclusion namely that all forms around him in nature are themselves symbols. That a tree is a symbol. A tree is not merely a symbol for man to use. Man is simply taking a more ancient natural symbol and reusing it. The fact that the tree is itself visible to his eyes is enough to prove that this tree is a visible extension of something not visible. Therefore, man can see the tree as it grows, but he cannot see the principle of tree. He cannot immediately apperceive tree as reality. He cannot know the life behind the tree, except by watching the operations of this life as these operations cause the tree to grow or to in some way modify the various visible uh, values which it exhibits. Thus nature is itself one vast symbol, one inconceivable uh, relationship of forms, all bearing witness to that which is not formed. A number of particulars 
bearing witness to invisible principles that lie behind all the concept of particular. Thus the authority of symbolism lies not in man's need for an expressing medium. The authority lies in the divine way of working. The universe itself moving into manifestation moves by projecting its own powers through forms and these forms are symbols of these powers mathematically geometrically crystallizing around waves or rays or rates of energy so that everything that exists is in some way a witness an evidence a kind of emblem standing for a principle itself invisible that this principle may be spirit may be soul may be mind may be God makes the symbolism only the more significant for here we are confronted uh, with the visible testimony of facts unseen a kind of covenant by which man stands forever in the presence of his own greatest source of instruction. Thus, as Pike points out, the universe is a great university of symbols, a tremendous school of emblems and devices through the contemplation of which man comes finally to understand himself, his world, and his creator. Thus symbolism involves us almost immediately in a series of great abstract value, values. And the fact of symbol is the first great link that man has with a world of spiritual forces operating behind the visible appearances of life. So the fact of symbol becomes the validity of symbolism. It becomes the proof of the meaningfulness of the entire concept. Man creating symbols, therefore, derives them by bestowing upon forms and likenesses already existing and already having meaning. Other meanings according to his own qualified understanding Therefore, he takes emblems having an absolute meaning, and he gives them a new relative meaning in order that he may use them uh, for the extension of his own awareness in some direction or under some condition. If, therefore, uh, the Chinese makes a glyph for the home, consisting of the combination of how, of roof, fire and the woman symbol. He is therefore expressing a basic concept. These devices are not home, nor are we to assume that he is merely attempting to establish the concept of a house. He is working for something else. He is working for the moral and emotional overtone of home. He is looking for its spiritual value, its ethical implication, and thus he captures in these basic forms ideas which are in harmony with his own insight. Yet each of these forms may have another meaning, a meaning especially in themselves. And this is true where the selection particularly involves natural working or natural objects rather than the artificial productions of man, as in the case of house, which is something man himself has built, and therefore has a meaning peculiar to man. But when he draws upon the earth and the sky and the flower and the rock, he is drawing upon things which he did not himself create, and therefore which have meaning apart from him, even though he wishes to give them a meaning of his own. In this way, symbolism has gradually associated itself with an infinite diversity of interpretive uh, factors. And these interpretations extending on through time have been refined and revised with the changing of human beliefs. Uh, the ancient meanings have been restored and lost again. And finally, new meanings 
have been imposed upon ancient substances which no longer seem relevant. Man, however, hit upon one other happy device in the development of symbolism. He knew that he was concerned to a measure with the restricting circumstance of literalism. There was always the, the deadly danger which man uh, faced, namely that in the field of learning, if he drew a picture of a tree, the student would be satisfied to say this is a tree and feel that he had solved it all. If, therefore, he surrounded the man primarily with only natural symbols, the human being would be almost in the same condition he would be without any symbols, because there are enough natural symbols forever around him. He sees the alternations of day and night, he beholds growth, he beholds all the strange and wonderful workings of natural law, these are his heritage. Therefore, to merely reproduce them, for his intellectual advancement would scarcely attain its end. He would only be using a crude substitute for a nobler original. But man discovered, perhaps through his sleep consciousness, through dreams and other things, that he could introduce an element of fantasy into the representation of these forms. He could create a class of forms called composita. He could make a thing unworldly by putting together natural emblems and symbols in an unnatural relationship. He found, for example, that as long as he drew pictures of men to represent his gods, the tendency of the people was to come to the conclusion that the gods were men. It read downward instead of upward. Instead of conveying the impression really that man is, god, that man is a god, the reverse became the common acceptance. But when, as in the case of the Egyptians, the human head was taken off and the radiant globe-clutching scarabasaka was placed on the shoulders of the human body so that it became a human body with a beetle's head, the inevitable result had to be that the mind could no longer search in its experience for a living example of this. They just couldn't do it. Or when they placed the symbol of the head of the Apis, the bull, upon the shoulders of the god Osiris, this Horapus or this deity could not be found among men. It represented a departure. Here we have now a fantasy. We had an unworldliness bestowed by distortion or by the creation of an unnatural combination leading to the recognition that the symbol had to do with something not of the common experience of man, but dealing with something else, something that could not be so easily interpreted and would have to be examined and explored upon a mental level or upon some plane of insight superior to that of ordinary mortals. Another simple way of doing the same thing was to disproportion the sizes of things. A very common practice, for example, in East Indian art. Here a great sage, teacher, or one of the deities is represented as a colossal figure, and the human disciple or student as a very small figure kneeling at its feet. The great figure thus became a symbol of unworldliness, a giantism, uh, which elevated it beyond the common experience of man. Such, perhaps, was the tremendous subtle influence of the Olympian Zeus, this monumental structure, this tremendous figure, or the great standing figure of Helios, the god of the sun, that stood at the gates of Rhodes and has been uh, preserved for us under the name of the Colossus of Rhodes. But by great disproportion, by great enlargement, an unworldliness was also created. Begin the refinement of things so as to create an unworldliness. <coughs> Might mean a creation of so sensitive, so truly and completely beautiful a thing that no equivalent could be found among men 
for it. The sublimity was used as a means of exaggeration. As Leonardo and Michelangelo realized and exhibited later, also the dynamic of the so-called heroic proportion, or by the voluntary and intentional distortion of the anatomy or structure of the human figure, this figure became symbolic of something not human, something either superhuman or subhuman, something beyond our immediate ken of comprehension. A great study was made, for example, of the familiar figure of Michelangelo's Moses. And it has been pointed out that if this figure should stand up, it would be the most disproportioned piece of art, perhaps, pr produced by a classical master. And the parts of the body are not in proportion to each other. But the compound effect is one of great majesty, of great force, and of a measure of patriarchal unworldliness, an escape from the literal, an escape from the obvious, into the expression of overtone through one kind of artistic subterfuge or another. Thus the symbol, in its simple language, began to take on many different aspects. Particularly, early man was interested in disentangling it from literalism and trying to use these familiar objects in a manner which would not convey merely a trite and familiar meaning. The symbol also gave rise to many other devices. It gave rise to emblems. And emblems, as pointed out by Quarles in his work on emblems, were really originally moral pictures. An emblem was a moral representation, gradually becoming more and more uh, stylized until it became a device, became a kind of reminder of quality rather than an actual picture of it. During the 17th century in Europe, there was a great number of emblem writers. These writers moralized upon practically every symbol, device, work of art, statue, uh, jewel, uh, fabrication of antiquity that we know. Every one of these had to be interpreted to have some bearing upon the moral need of man. The purpose was to produce the good man or to remind the individual of moral virtues by simple pictures. These books, of course, were largely worn out by children because young people uh, received most of their early schooling from these old emblem books. Another type, of course, that also came into uh, prominence was the gradual development of the word emblem. In other words, symbolism was not absolutely restricted uh, to a representation of an object, it could be associated uh, verbally with the description groups of emblems have been closely associated with sects and creeds that have made use of the emblem in one way or another in their teachings. And this part of the teaching has become uh, so familiar that the picture is used to substitute for the reference to the factor involved. Religious emblems that we remember immediately, of course, bring to mind uh, the, the Christian cross, uh, which is associated with the most dramatic episode in the life of the founder of the faith. We find that in India, in Buddhism, for example, the chakra, or wheel with eight spokes, the noble eightfold path and the wheel of the law, has become practically a universal symbol for Buddhism as a religious philosophy. It has gained the same general acceptance that the cross has in Christianity. Perhaps uh, equally uh, important in the Judaistic system is the sacred name, formed of flaming letters, which has also a great uh, sacredness. Perhaps the outstanding religious emblem of the Jewish people uh, is made up of the two tablets of the law, bearing letters or characters signifying the commandments. In Islam, the great symbol is the crescent of the planet Venus, 
which has to do very much with the development of their faith. And this has been universally uh, accepted among Muslim states. Among Hindus, the most common symbol is the Amkara, or an elaborate device formed of the letters of the sacred name. These devices we generally recognize today as the trademarks of religions and faiths. In China, Taoism, of course, is uh, represented by the yin-yang symbol or the two hemispheres interlocking, the light and dark hemispheres of a circle. All these emblems have, therefore, gradually come to be identified with great systems of thought and they become immediately uh, able to stimulate in us a basic grand picture of a doctrine, of an idea, or of a way of life. These are the more simple explanations, however, and we must still penetrate into that field of research in which Pike was most concerned. He came to the conclusion that there was an essential and valid language of symbols, an alphabet of them, that while in various nations they were somewhat modified, still there was a great body of symbolism, essentially sacred and essentially dedicated to the perpetuation of knowledge without revelation by word. Therefore, the communication of certain secrets from age to age, from time to time, was accomplished by means of symbols, even as the ancient craftsmen in the days of the cathedral builders of Europe each marked his stone with his master's mark, a mark peculiar to himself, and being the same permanent record that prim the primary man or ancient man carved so crudely upon some boulder. This uh, record of the master's marks also extended throughout the world, for the same marks that are found on the cathedrals of Europe are also found on the Taj Mahal, on the Qub de Menah at Delhi, and upon the great monuments of the Hindu and Muslim world. Therefore, this practice of marking goes on throughout the world. And these marks that were on the cathedral stones of Europe are almost identical with the caste marks worn on the forehead of various Hindu sects, the members of the sects. Thus this language of basic idea has spread to become perhaps the world's most simple means of the perpetuation and communication of secret knowledge of knowledge hidden in cipher, in code, that these symbols form an elaborate cryptogram. The only difference being that instead of finding one simple easy key which unlocks it, the keys were lost in the debris of the ancient world. And Pike said that it was his opinion that these older keys would not be found again, that these keys had disappeared with the invaluable guidance given by the ancient teachers who had themselves vanished from among us, and that the great heritage of symbols still stands before us as the unlocked treasure house of knowledge, and that until we ourselves set to work to follow the words of Omar, the tent maker, uh, to file from our own base metals the key that will unlock the door that these symbols must remain comparatively unintelligible to us. Assuming that there may be a certain validity in this, and I think there is a very great validity, what are we going to do when it comes to our turn to attempt to penetrate these symbols? We have, first of all, to answer a simple question, perhaps, and that is just what is the vitality and life within a symbol. Is a symbol a living thing? Is it a dead thing? What is this symbol? It is some kind of a formula. It is power locked in a picture. Perhaps a very crude picture. 
and perhaps with only a very few lines. But still it is a power locked in a picture. And why do we say that it is a power? Because we say that in some way it is a truth. And that a truth is always a power. For a truth is the power which enables man to achieve his great victory over ignorance in some particular, in some way, or upon some level of function or understanding. Thus a symbol has, we shall say, an essential meaning, that it has its root in some law. It must, because it is derived from nature, and everything in nature is meaningful. It also has, as I said, an accumulated series of meanings. And the individual confronted with a symbol is at first placed at a serious disadvantage. We will imagine that for some reason and in some way you have wandered into the ruin of some ancient Egyptian temple. And there, half buried in the sand, among the wreckage of time, you see graved upon the wall of that room in strange deep cuttings of abstract artistic merit a strange and powerful device a symbol what the symbol is for the moment is unimportant because its name is legion but that it is an arresting device we will admit perhaps it came down to us from Talamara and the strange pathetic reformation of Akhenaten over the faiths of Egypt, this strange mystic living in a world of symbols. But whatever it may be, there it is. So what will you do with it? Well, if you're inquisitive, the first thought you probably will have is to look in the guidebook quickly and see whether somebody uh, of note and importance hasn't seen this before and uh, has a nice pat explanation that will require no further mentation on your part. So perhaps if you are more fortunate than most tourists, you will find it in the guidebook. The general experience is, however, that you will find everything else. That particular emblem, uh, some way, escaped attention. But assuming that you do find it, you will then find what Maspero thought it meant. You will find what Petrie thought it meant. You will find a learned opinion by Piazza Smythe, the old astronomer royal of Scotland who was in those parts. Perhaps you will find a very erudite description by Lepsius, or you can find uh, a little more in Wilkinson's uh, Manners and Customs of the Ancient Egyptians, or in one of the admirable handbooks of Sir A. E. Wallace Budge. You will get some kind of an interpretation, probably, if you look far enough. But what will you get? You will get the same type of interpretation that was based upon the learning or scholarship of that school of Egyptologists that has risen since Champollion and which has dominated the field ever since. They will tell you all they know, but what they know will be based largely upon Egypt. Well, Egypt in the days when that symbol was cut also had a great deal of knowledge about its own time. Probably it knew more about its day than we will ever know. Had this symbol then simply been a trite representation of something already known, it probably would not have been placed there. The Egyptian only put it there in the first place because it represented something that he could not reveal in any other way. Something that meant something inside of him. Not just merely the perpetuation of ornate devices uh, uh, which were everyday knowledge to himself, even though they may be extremely mysterious to us. So a great symbol was a great symbol in Egypt at the time it was placed on the temple wall, just as much as it is a great symbol today. And it is quite possible that thousands of Egyptians went by that symbol during the great period of the dynasties, and they did not know what it meant. Or it may be that it was anciently the wall of a sanctuary, where an initiated priest in his mysterious robes of blue and gold and wearing the great gilded triangular apron of his sect brought the neophyte and there attempted to unfold for him some strange and recondite meaning for this emblem. But one thing is sure, the emblem is not going to be easily unlocked. 
is going to fight to hold its secret just as much as you may fight to take that secret from it. As Pike said in his little article I read to you, each of these symbols is a kind of sphinx, and each one who comes into the presence of it and tries to solve its riddle is also a kind of Oedipus. And this Oedipus must either solve the riddle or perish at the, uh, by the cruelty or the strange device which he has been unable to fathom. So we come into the presence of the symbol and we realize that it represents design, that perhaps like the famous old Etruscan frying pan, it was a masterpiece in higher mathematics and that only by a mathematical code can we decipher it. But then when we have deciphered it, we lift a veil only to find other veils behind. How then shall we approach the symbol? Shall we approach it only with the hope that, or perhaps even the fear that we shall discover that the Egyptian knew as much as we do? Will we approach it in the uh, possibility that it may contain some interesting uh, and novel uh, formula that we can dramatize or fictionalize in our way of life? Probably for many one of a hundred reasons, if we glance a second time, we will continue to ponder the symbol. What then is, is our answer? We have some reason to believe that it was put there by someone for a reason and a purpose. That that man could know us or would have any great or powerful interest in our way of life is rather unthinkable. Man looking at the symbol is not fulfilling it. It is not merely intended to draw out of him the experiences of his century. It is interesting to see, however, to what degree this symbol becomes a drawing power and may also draw out of the individual levels of knowledge that he did not know he possessed because he had never before been subjected to a riddle. A riddle forces the individual uh, to probe within the recesses of his own knowledge, seeking for something that at least has a bearing on the problem, or a clue, or some association by means of which the unknown becomes intelligible. But even if he does this, and he does it thoroughly and painstakingly, he only arrives at a certain formula of his own, passes on, his place is taken by another man who repeats the process. Each, because of different experience, comes to a somewhat different conclusion, and the symbol is consequently always a mirror reflecting that which is within the beholder, casting back himself upon himself, but its own inscrutable mystery is still utterly locked. Therefore, the, this uh, attitude is not entirely satisfactory. So the symbolist, and Pike belongs to that group, points out that in order to break the symbol, in order to actually penetrate it, it is not possible merely to make a photographic reproduction of it in our minds or to battle out our brains against its strange and fantastic construction. There has to be another way. There has to be something else. And that something else implies the possibility of the individual becoming receptive to the total impact of the symbol itself not only to discover what it can mean to him, what it may have meant to the Egyptian, but also what it really means. And this real meaning implies, of course, something else also. That in a moment of inspiration, someone put it there. What this inspiration level was, we cannot know. But if the symbol has survived as a great and magnificent arresting thing, that level of inspiration must be explored. We've got to try to find again the consciousness of the man who put the symbol there. This does not mean that if we do, we shall finally solve it. But it does mean that we shall come a little nearer to solution. We shall have a better grasp than merely imposing our own nature upon the symbol. 
Great symbols are nearly always strangely orderly, wonderfully mathematical, and while their essential principles may be obscured by flourishes and artistic devices, each one is based upon a grand concept. It is a cross or a circle or a triangle or a square. It has some tremendous basic mathematical strength, or perhaps numerical arrangement by which it has a strange and deep meaning. There is a pattern there. There is always an orderly progression of things. Thus the symbol invites us to contemplation. It invites us not to an aggressive effort to conquer it. It invites us to meet it in a more or less receptive manner, opening ourselves to it persuading it to come forth rather than demanding it to come forth. It also must free us in some way from our own eternal resolution to read into that symbol our own meanings or the meanings of our times or the ethics of our times or the morality of our times. What we must try to find out is what it meant. And as it probably arose from this great system of world mysteries, the great educational body of the past. This symbol may well be part of the great textbook of essential learning, a strange essay, a wonderful composition placed there with masterly skill, not only to confuse the ages, but in some strange way to bind the truth seeker of the present to the truth discoverer of the past. Thus the, the problem of the impact of the symbol, the effort to decode it, may lead us in many directions. As Pike points out, one of the first things that a good symbol does for us is to show us how ignorant we are. And that is an admirable beginning for something. It suddenly reminds us that the common knowledge that we have is not very valuable in an uncommon situation. It further also reminds us, if we think a little more, that the common knowledge uh, that we have has very seldom been sufficient in any situation. That we are dying of our common knowledge. <laughs> and that unless we do something about it, we shall continue to die. Thus it uh, behooves us uh, to explore the symbol. And the moment we start on it, we are dedicated to the great course, the study of prim primordial man and his search for light. We must, to a certain degree, have the same experience which Pike himself had, drawn into masonry by the rather natural circumstances of the time. He became aware that he stood in a great palace of symbols. Gradually it dawned upon him that these symbols were the soul of something, that this organization which he had joined was not merely a body of persons tied together by dues, it was a symbol of something. It was something that tied into a challenge, a challenge that could only be solved in one way, and that was by the attainment of universal enlightenment. That symbol would always be there, pointing a strange, abstract, accusing finger at the individual, solemnly pronouncing his ignorance, until that symbol itself was completely and entirely unfolded. And to search through these symbols is a very valuable experience uh, for persons in practically every walk of life, because this temple with its numerous and wonderful tracings, is only a miniature of the great temple of the heavens, the temple of earth, the temple of the world, upon the surfaces of which are innumerable wonderful patterns, designs, and figures. Men must read these figures and live, or remain ignorant of them and die. Life is just that simple. Either man must solve the riddle of nature, the riddle of the great sphinx that sits forever on the threshold of the unknown. Man must solve the riddle of himself or die. 
He must solve the riddle of universal law, achieving an obedience which will enable him to live, or else he will die. He must either find the great principles which underlie all forms and appearances and cling to those principles, or he will not find them and he will perish for need of them. So our great search for these symbolic insights forces us to begin the long and perhaps arduous path that leads man uh, from the appearances of things to the essences of things, from religion as a formal structure to religion as a divine revelation, from philosophy as a confusing path of intellectualism to philosophy as an outpouring of universal wisdom from the divine nature. These paths must be followed in the search for truths. And in the following of these paths, one by one, the superstitions and fallacies of man fall away. We discover truly that we cannot go far in the world of serious scholarship without feeling ourselves drawn more and more closely to the human need. We cannot search into the great origins of our knowledge without gaining a greater respect for persons of all places and types. The symbolist seeking to find the answer no longer lives in a world of believers and unbelievers. He no longer belongs to a world of those of the true faith and pagans and heathens. He lives in a world of individuals, each of whom is tracing the symbols of his faith and trying to find at the source of those symbols the certain and sure fact which is the root of faith. Thus universal knowledge gradually opens. And in every field of life we use the symbols of our trades and our professions as ways of discovering the nature and substance of ourselves. Arts and sciences are of very little value if they merely accepted for themselves. But if each is represented and recognized as the proneos of a temple, a gate leading into an inner sanctuary of greater knowing, then even the simplest things that men do become em emblems of the deepest things men seek. Thus the body becomes the emblem to the physician. The course of the blood, the structure of the muscles, the arrangements of the bones, the chemistries of function, all of these things are symbols of universal truth. To the architect, the laws of building become the symbols. To the painter, color, form, Organization become the symbols. To the musician, sound, notes, keys, scales, all these things become the emblems and symbols of universal knowing. For everything men do is symbolical of the one thing that man is trying to do and which he goes about so awkwardly and so often with such profanity of spirit. To discover these emblems, to unlock their secrets, then causes man to begin the long journey, the great journey uh, into homelessness, as Buddha called it. This journey that goes on and on and must leave behind by degrees everything that has been, has been established as a fixation, as a point, as an inevitable. One by one we outgrow our own ultimates. One by one we pass beyond the smug certain boundaries of our own particular worlds to go out into homelessness, to go out into this state which is seeking only truth and which cannot find this final form in any place along the path but must rest a while with some opinion and doctrine and then pass on into the wilderness again seeking for that which is beyond words or description. Thus approached, the symbol becomes a tremendous dynamic, a way of leading all human beings into causes and paths of personal growth. The moment, for instance, that we take the sacred literature of the world and we look beneath the surface of it and we accept scriptures, writings of this nature, as great works of symbolism rather than as historical works we leave the smug 
this fireside of the historical home ground and go into homelessness. We go into wandering. We go into an unknown world in which perhaps there seem to be no guideposts at all. But actually, we cannot help it for the simple reason that no matter how sincere we may be, we must ultimately find any pattern of beliefs too small to allow for the growth that goes on in ourselves. Now when we say that we pass on from one level of symbolism to another, Pike points out to us also that these levels do not deny each other. The fact that we have outgrown a symbol or left it like some dead seashell along the shore of life's great ocean does not mean that that meaning we have left behind is untrue. It means, however, that it is incomplete. It means that no matter how fondly we have embraced it and held it, we have not exhausted the symbol. We have come to some pleasant and appropriate acceptance, perhaps an acceptance which we share with a million, ten million, five hundred million other human beings who also have accepted this acceptance and built their values around it. But this does not mean that this acceptance is ultimate, nor does it mean that there can be no greater key to the same symbol. Thus, for example, in our modern time, as we pointed out in an earlier course uh, that we gave, in our modern time, we have to depart from one of the most common and literal of all symbols, and that is history as moral instruction. We soon discover that the least meaning of a symbol is its history, or the historical event or circumstance with which it is associated. No man can find salvation by reading history alone. He may contemplate upon it and discover salvation, but the mere acceptance of it will not do this. It is only that, if he, that he can unlock history with the same dynamic key which makes it bear witness to universal realities. Only in this way can he find in history the great spiritual inspiration without which his purpose is in vain. But the literal the historical is the deepest and heaviest veil upon a symbol and from this we must pass immediately not denying the history but denying that history will save us and go on to search and explore the universal meanings behind these devices almost immediately we do realize that we share symbols that the triangle which we use so commonly, I've seen it over the doors of countless churches, this upright blazing triangle. We share it with the Greeks, we share it with the Chinese and the Hindus, we share it with the Muslim and the Persian. We share this symbol with other people all over the world. Thus by the fact that we share comes into light another interesting point. Great philosophical religious systems of mystical symbolism are in many cases emphases. They are not separate revelations, not religions apart from all other faith. They are man's search for truth, held within a framework of time and place, and subjected to the environmental limitations of race, of nation, of political histories, and many things of that nature. But the principles behind these faiths are unfolded peculiarly according to the need of certain peoples under certain conditions and under certain pressures. It may well happen then that it will require all of these faiths and then more to unlock the meaning of the simplest symbol. It may mean that in one emblem we shall have to go through a dozen faiths in order to begin to perceive the law and principle that underlies it. Now these faiths in turn may be exhausted and we may still not come to the very essence of the symbol because the essence of the symbol uh, like the peculiar meaning of a dream is extremely elusive. 
And uh, as the modern psychologist realizes, these symbols arise from very deep psychic pressures within the collective or folk structure of humanity. But assuming that we have studied, that we have begun to ex explore these things, along this way of searching, we make many other discoveries. And in the search for essential truth, the byproducts are almost as important as the product itself. Because along the way, we gain admiration for our fellow men. We gain understanding of their searching. We gain inspiration from the great and beautiful truths that they have discovered. We gain fellowship with them in the simple problems of their living. And we move inevitably from a purely intellectual position to one of the deepest compassion and emotional acceptance of things uh, that perhaps once were strange, difficult, and unknown to us. Thus, one of the great results of an honest search is the discovery of friend, the discovery of brotherhood, the discovery of the right power and purpose of working together for these great ends which we have none of us yet fully attained. Therefore, it is not that one shall lead and others shall follow, but in the search for truth, we are all brothers, searching together for that which is beyond us all. Consequently, our small jealousies and our petty prejudices can dissolve when we realize that we all bear approximately the same relationship to the sovereign center of truth that one does not possess it and is passing it out to others, but that all, possessing parts of it, are searching for all of it, and sharing the parts together advances the search for totality. So we go on in these symbolisms until finally we come to what might, as Pike pointed out, be the greatest key of all. Through learning we advance our course a certain way. But the course itself cannot be completed until the individual himself, who is the truth seeker, recognizes the sovereign importance of so adjusting his own nature and disposition that he is capable of a knowledge beyond his present state. Thus, uh, Pike points out the great systems of disciplines advocated in the Eleusinia, in the Hindu mysteries in China, and in all parts of the world. Namely, that insight, true insight, arises from conduct. That true knowledge is not possible to the ignorant until certain other things have been achieved. Consequently, the search for the symbol, the tremendous invitation of this riddle, the progressing of it along natural and reasonable lines until we are finally frustrated, beholding a great spiral staircase rising as in the wonderful table of sea bees. Then suddenly the realization that we cannot finally come to solution without the total reformation of ourselves. That from the, the, our own natures, the eye must be fashioned that can see beyond the horizon of form and place. Thus in the Egyptian rites and in the Greek <coughs> rites, the uh, seeker after truth had to carry the small lamp of his own attainment when he examined all of these strange cuttings and symbols and pictures and devices. Without the lamp of his own soul, without the light within him, the meaning could never be found. So we come back to the simple concept as taught by Jesus and Buddha and many others, but with a new meaning, a new de degree of value, namely that the truth seeker, in order to attain, must place himself <coughs> under the laws which he seeks to understand. Until he makes this personal consecration or dedication of his own nature, he cannot have the insight necessary to see. So in the great structures which used these symbols originally, discipleship always preceded acceptance into the mysteries. Uh, Albert Pike gives us quite a detailed description of the great rituals held at the time of the Eleusinian mysteries in Attica in Greece. 
These were the state mysteries. They were the mysteries which citizenship in Greece permitted the individual uh, to attend. Those who were born citizens, free born of Greece, men and women, were permitted to be initiated into the Iliocinian rites. The first or lower rituals were given uh, to all who sought, and any person well born above the age of 12 years was entitled to receive the rituals. He, be he beheld the great symbolic pageantry of this rite, by means of which he gained a more or less total impact of the great Orphic mystery, which was the spiritual root of his culture. Because everything that was Greek art, Greek music, Greek literature, Greek philosophy, and Greek religion arose from this great core of the Orphic revelation, the hymns, the mystical songs of Orpheus, the strange, secret, tender ritual of universal love which lay at the root of all Greek culture. But after the neophyte had taken this lesser ritual, he then had to indicate his future. He had to wait for years before he was eligible to take the greater ritual for which only certain persons uh, were entitled. He had to earn this. He had to wait for it. And his waiting and his earning was a matter of great expectancy. Some way he knew or sensed or felt that this other experience was a strange transforming thing that to pass through the great rite was to be born again. And as surely as he was so twice born, he was given the keys of heaven and the great power over uh, the world and universe in which he lived. But the priests in sober and uh, contrite circle warned him of this important step. They warned him that this ritual, this greater degree, would only be conferred upon him when he had attained certain virtues in his own life. Only when he could honestly prove that he was no longer dominated by the ordinary impulses of human nature, that he was no longer selfish, no longer arrogant, no longer easily moved from the quiet contemplation of values, no longer a vengeful or worrisome mood, no longer envious of the success of others, no longer subject uh, to the tyrannies of life, that gradually he had subsided and subdued these things within himself, that quiet, dedicated to truth alone, willing to sacrifice life and honor upon the altar of reality, then and then only could he enter the sanctuary. Then and then only would he be given the great rites. For strangely enough, as General Pike also points out, the supreme wisdom is reserved for those who no longer need it. In other words, this ritual becomes merely a symbolical thing because it is by the path leading to the symbol that man gradually discovers its meaning. He gradually subsides these obscuring factors within his own nature. And as he becomes truly still within and has transformed all base values into the purest alchemical gold of transmutation and regeneration, he beholds the great symbol moving in as it moved in upon St. Hildegard of Bingen the sky opening, the earth beneath his feet opening, the air filled with symbols, everything moving into life. And by that time, his own cleared insight shows him the kind of world that brings him to his knees in absolute admiration of the ineffable beauty, sublimity, and divinity of even the simplest form of life. And General Pike says there is not the smallest bird that flies in the sky, and he was very fond of birds, that does not clutch forever in its talons the silken thread of universal truth. In other words, it is inseparable from nothing. Nothing can be divided from it. So when 
the neophyte, having passed his test, having become wise in the wisdom that is not of this world, having gradually subsided and subdued all these false pressures within himself, is at last brought into the presence of the symbol, the mystery of which he sought to penetrate. And coming into the presence of this symbol, he is no longer in the presence of a question at all. He does not say, now I know what it means. He does not say, this line means this, that line means that, and where these two come together means another great and vital point. I am overjoyed. Now I will go home and live with my symbol. He does not say anything of this nature because as the Eleusinian initiate learned when he comes into the presence of the symbol like Oxiton before the great hand rayed sun disk of the Aton he looks upon it he sees no longer a symbol he sees no longer a device he is the ancient said he sees merely the blazing form of God all symbol ends in the fact that that symbol is a veil over the face of God. He is no longer interested in an answer because the answer blazes into him. He is in the presence of the ineffable. He is in the presence of a thing that has come to life because he has brought himself to life. And he stands thus in the presence of the all radiant and falling on his knees he does not ask he worships. And when he has achieved to this point, he has solved the mystery of symbolism. All other things must precede it. He must remove the veils one by one. But behind all veils of form, of words, of thought, of meaning and idea, behind the last of these veils is the great face of the ineffable. And when man takes away the last veil, only God remains. This concept is the meaning of this tremendous vital search for the significance. It is the search for the Holy Grail. It is the search of the orders of the quest through the ages of chivalry. It is the end of the mendicants wandering. It's the end of the Hindus pilgrimage around the rocky base of Mount Kalasa. It is again this endless search for the Chan Shambhala beyond the sky. It is always the same. It is the search for the substance behind the shadow. And the wise discover in the end that divinity is the only substance behind the shadow. And that to discover this is to be one with it. To discover this is to lose the interest we have in the particular and adore the great gilded structure or golden radiant structure of the universal. This is our way and each of these symbols is a little thread leading us through a labyrinth like that of Ariadne and out of this labyrinth we must find our way or else be killed by the minotaur that guards its deepest parts. So man escaping along the thread of symbol finds it much easier to escape this way than he does through the heavy and clanking chains of dogma. He finds that dogma does not open him, it closes him. He finds that explanations as commonly given do not open him, they close him. The only way explanations open, them, open him is when he realizes that this is an explanation, but we must continue on for the explanation. We must find the name of the symbol. And when we receive that name, we discover that its name is namelessness. It is a very uh, critical and difficult thing for us to understand. But names disappear in the substances for which they stand. Words and the ideas for which they are but symbols. And the world as form, the world as idea, the world as thought, the world as symbol vanishes in the world as God. This was the wisdom of the ancients. This was the old path. 
And this is the path that General Pike sought to re-engrave upon the hearts and souls of those who followed in his footsteps in the pathway of the degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. He was seeking to remind them from their various stations and their various places with their numerous loads, burdens, responsibilities, prejudices and opinions that this was the old road, the ancient road of man growing up by piercing pictures and going on to the material value which was behind them. That all these pictures are actually part not of man's knowing truth but of man's becoming truth. That the end of the symbol is that man himself as the great symbol shall unfold that every symbol invites man to grow from within his own nature, not merely by interpreting it, but by experiencing it. And as his disciplines increase, his vision increases also. Now, one of the simplest of all disciplines is scholarship. Because it orders the mind, it makes things regular and reasonable, it usually dedicates the individual to some cause beyond wealth, for most scholars are proverbially poor. It causes the individual to create dedications that become very important to him. And also he gains a certain self-discipline by which he is able to advance further. Thus, through scholarship and through attentiveness, he strengthens resources. But he also comes then to another veil through which scholarship cannot pass. So at the proper time he must cast it down, preserving only to himself the power of self-control which it has given him, and go on into another kind of dimension of experience, in which everything that he has seen from afar comes nearer. Everything which he has seen through a veil darkly he may contemplate face to face. And this way the symbol strangely draws him on. It is like Gator's eternal feminine that draws man ever across the great abyss of illusion. The symbol is therefore quite truly the great ornamentation of man's great temple of ethical growth. It is an eternal testimony to his need and an eternal doorway to the fulfillment of that need. Pike would then not be incorrect when he said that the great wealth of a society or an organization lies in its symbols, that these are its locked soul, and that these symbols can not only unlock them themselves, but they can unlock the souls of those who seek to understand and therefore bridge this strange and incredible interval between appearances and substances. Thus in the world of symbols let us be mindful and let us also recognize the importance of finding that in the end we may say now I know and then if we are asked what we know we must answer I do not know. This thing that is found is found as a total experience. It is not a discovery of a particular, but the tremendous impact of a universe opening, blazing its eternal splendor upon our consciousness and drawing us once more into the solemn and sacred union with that eternal value, that eternal life, that eternal power which is at the root of us. So we open both the innermost and the outermost. And we open the furthermost with the innermost. And as we unfold the utility, the mystery within ourselves, we see its blazing likeness unfolding in the symbol before us. This is the great concentration symbol, the great mandala, which locks the world. At the end of the quest, man coming finally to know, discovers not that he knows, but that he is. And in the attainment of becomingness, all mysteries are solved, all secrets are unveiled, all riddles answered. 
and these riddles are all concealed within the mystery of the divine mind and the divine spirit and the symbol is the path that leads through itself to that which is beyond human comprehension I think that is a fair statement of General Pike's opinion and I think it is very well worthy of our thought and consideration and we will continue our study of his work next week